One day, Phil Knight woke up from a nightmare where his life had no purpose, and to his shock, he realized that it wasn't just a bad dream. The feeling was all too real as he was uncertain about what he wanted to do with his life, and this nightmare only made it worse. So, he decided to go to University of Oregon to study journalism. It was here that he discovered his love for running and met the legendary track coach Bill Bowerman, who had trained many Olympic athletes. Little did they know their friendship would eventually make way for the creation of the world's largest sports company, but we'll get to that. After graduating with a degree in journalism in 1959, Phil still felt lost and unsure of what his next move should be. He had always dreamed of becoming an athlete, but at 24 years old, he had to face the harsh reality. The dream was dead. That's when Phil decided to enroll in Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. While working on an assignment to create a new business, Phil noticed how two Japanese camera companies, Nikon and Canon, had replaced German cameras dominant in the market. and he wondered if the same thing could happen with running shoes at that time adidas and puma the two german companies were dominating the american running shoe market phil wanted to introduce japanese shoes to the american market and he knew that it would be cheaper to produce shoes in japan he became deeply invested in his assignment and believed there was a significant business opportunity but despite his enthusiasm no one else including his friends seemed to share this vision Phil then decided to go on a trip around the world with one of his friends which led him to travel to Japan in 1962 to explore the feasibility of his idea. There he came across one particular running shoe that caught his eye. The brand was called Tiger and the shoes were manufactured by a company known as Onitsuka. Apart from the impressive design, the shoes met Phil's two main criteria: superior quality and affordability. He was so impressed with the shoes that he cold called the owners to set up a meeting. Despite his lack of experience in the shoe business, Phil presented himself as an American shoe distributor who could help market Onitsuka shoes in America. He had extensively researched the American shoe market as part of his university assignment, allowing him to present his idea with utmost confidence, impressing the Japanese managers. Phil eventually agreed to be Onitsuka's distributor in the US and requested the company to ship some shoe samples to his US address. After receiving the samples he was excited to show them to his old running coach Bill Bowerman who was highly respected in the world of running and had always been obsessed with improving athlete shoes. Phil was eager to hear his opinion on the new Japanese running shoes and was pleasantly surprised when Bowerman liked them so much that he offered to be Phil's business partner. With his extensive experience in training athletes and building track shoes, Bowerman was the perfect partner for Phil. They agreed to become co-founders of Blue Ribbon Sports with each of them investing $500 into the company and placed an order for 300 pairs of shoes from Japan. After securing exclusive distribution rights for the Tiger shoes in the Western United States, a shipment of 300 pairs arrived in April 1964. Phil started by selling shoes from the trunk of his car at track meets and running clubs and sold them all within 3 months. The demand for high quality shoes at an affordable price was high and by the end of their first year Blue Ribbon Sports had sold $8000 worth of shoes and the business was thriving. In 1966 with the increasing sales they decided to establish their own retail stores to sell their shoes. To make it a unique place they designed it as a sanctuary for the runners where they could not only buy shoes but also hang out, talk and browse through shelves stacked with books related to running. While Phil and Jeff Johnson focused on business operations, Bowerman worked on the creative side. Once a shipment arrived from the Japan, he would take a few shoes and rip them apart to see how they were designed. After he had studied the shoe, he would make notes and send them to the manufacturer for implementation before the next shipment. In effect, Bowerman was now designing Onitsuka shoes for them. Since he was also coaching popular runners and future Olympians, it helped them to build their brand further and sell even more shoes. After some trouble convincing Onitsuka, Phil got the rights to be exclusive distributor for Tiger shoes across all of America. But he needed funds to support this expansion. To raise money, Phil sent out flyers advertising the chance for people to invest in Blue Ribbon Sports, but nobody responded. However, the parents of one of Blue Ribbon's early employees, Bob Woodill, believed in the company and offered to put in their entire life savings of $8000, which Phil reluctantly accepted since the banks had refused to loan him more money. Phil and Bowerman admired the quality of Onitsuka shoes and their partnership with Blue Ribbon Sports made the Japanese brand successful in the US. However, the rapid expansion of their business caused financial strain due to new store openings and increased demand for their popular shoe, the Cortez. Despite Phil's efforts to speed up shipments from Onitsuka, the Japanese company maintained the same pace. In an attempt to resolve these issues and discuss renewing their contract, Phil arranged a meeting with a representative from Onitsuka. 
but the meeting did not go well as they didn't seem interested in renewing a long-term deal with Blue Ribbon, citing disappointed sales. Phil couldn't understand this. After all, it was Blue Ribbon Sports that introduced the Tiger brand in America, and sales were growing every year. Not to mention that Bowman had helped improve their shoe designs. Phil Knight had started to become suspicious, and he arranged meetings with 18 other athletic shoe distributors across the U.S. And it was now clear that Onitsuka was secretly planning to replace Blue Ribbon and find a new distributor. According to Onitsuka's executives, since they had now gained a significant foothold in the US, thanks to Blue Ribbon's efforts, they now saw the need to move on to more experienced distributors to expand and increase their revenue. Phil was angry, but most of all, he was hurt. He confronted Onitsuka about their plan to find a new distributor, while they still had a contract in place for another year. However, the Japanese brand gave Phil an ultimatum. Sell 51% of Blue Ribbon's sports to them, or they would make deals with other distribution partners. Phil immediately rejected the offer to sell his company and was in disbelief that this was happening. Despite the shock of it all, Phil knew there was only one way forward. If Onitsuka planned to partner with other American distributors, it was time for war. The co-founders saw losing the Onitsuka Tiger brand as an opportunity to be more than just a distributor. After all, Bowman had designed Onitsuka's best-selling shoe, the Cortez. So why couldn't Blue Ribbon just make their own shoes and sell them? And this would solve their problem of waiting for shipments and give them more control over the production process. So the two co-founders gathered the whole team together and began working on creating their own original shoes, instead of selling Onitsuka's Tiger shoes. But first, they needed a new name. Phil initially suggested Dimension 6 to be their brand name, but pretty much nobody else on the team liked it. And then their first employee, Jeff Johnson, suggested the name Nike. Although Phil was initially hesitant about the name, he eventually agreed to it due to the urgent need to start planning for their new shoe brand. Next up, they recruited a graphic design student from a nearby university to create the logo. And she came up with the now iconic swoosh for just $35. After finalizing the name and logo, the next challenge for Phil and his team was to find a shoe manufacturer who could produce high-quality shoes at an affordable price. He ensured they didn't repeat the mistakes made with Onitsuka and focused on establishing a network of manufacturers to have full control over production. However, the dealings with Onitsuka did not end there as the company actually sued Blue Ribbon Sports for breaching their contract by creating the Nike brand. In response, Phil sued them back stating that Onitsuka was attempting to break the exclusivity deal by signing new distributors. After settling their dispute, Blue Ribbon Sports officially became Nike in 1971, with the company generating over a million dollars in sales per year and started expanding rapidly. At the 1972 Olympics, Nike gained a lot of global exposure, leading to a significant increase in their sales. And by 1976, their revenue had reached $14 million, doubling to $28 million in 1977. Phil continued to invest in growth by opening new factories worldwide and making Nike a fashion statement. But despite Nike's success, they were still cash poor, and Phil considered taking the company public to fund the expansion. But things took a turn for the worse when a bill from the US Customs Service demanded $25 million, threatening to shut down the business. Nike's competitors Keds and Converse lobbied the customs office to impose an import duty of 20% of the competitor's selling price, called the American Selling Price Rule. Since Nike wasn't manufacturing shoes in America, they were hit with high import fees resulting in the $25 million bill. Nike eventually hired a lawyer and went to court against the customs office and the likes of Converse and Kets for three years. Finally, Nike settled for $9 million, allowing them to put the whole thing behind them and continue growing. Nike emerged stronger than ever, and in 1980, the company went public, eliminating its cash flow problems and allowing it to accelerate its growth. But here's the interesting part. The parents of an early Nike employee had invested their life savings to help the company stay afloat, without expecting any return on investment. They were given shares in exchange, and after Nike went public, Phil had the pleasure of informing them that their initial $8,000 investment was now worth $1.6 million. Phil Knight then expanded Nike's business and diversified their product line by introducing clothing which not only helped them earn more profits and attract more investors, but also gave them an advantage in negotiating endorsement deals with athletes. Nike's success was also due to their ability to secure endorsement deals with promising young athletes like Tiger Woods and LeBron James early in their careers, which further propelled their popularity. And let's not forget Michael Jordan's endorsement deal, which turned out to be their most profitable. Jordan's shoe line Air Jordans generated enormous revenue contributing to Nike surpassing Converse to become America's top sports brand by 1986. At this point, you might be thinking that Nike is simply an incredible business success story. 
but here's the thing behind all that success nike was hiding a dark truth that involved brutal intimidation exploitation of labor harassment and child labor and this secret was soon to be revealed in 1991 american labor activist jeffrey ballinger exposed nike's child labor practices and exploitation of people living in underdeveloped countries Then in 2001 a BBC documentary further revealed poor working conditions and the use of child labor in a Nike factory in Cambodia. These allegations caused a significant backlash including protests, boycotts and the university's cutting ties with the company. Nike's sales dropped and the stock fell by 15% as the media portrayed Nike as an exploitative corporation. Phil Knight who had always been depicted as a good guy now found himself in the role of a bad guy. This was a new challenge for Knight and he promised to take personal responsibility for improving working conditions at Nike factories across the world. But the truth is that the company was established on the foundation of seeking cheaper labor abroad to produce high quality shoes at lower prices than their competitors. And to be fair, Nike did make changes to improve working conditions and many human rights activists had acknowledged their efforts. But the allegations never fully stopped. In 2005, a company report revealed that 50% of its factories still forced workers to work 60-hour weeks, paid less than minimum wage, and denied them access to basic necessities. More recently, in December 2021, Nike and other brands were accused of benefiting from forced labor in China. Now, the sad truth is, numerous multinational companies use overseas labor with questionable working conditions in their supply chains. Many of the items we use daily may have been produced with cheap labor under harsh working conditions. Almost every business has a darker side if you look deep enough but what sets Nike apart is how they turn controversies into making more money. In 2018, Nike's Dream Crazy ad campaign featuring NFL player Colin Kaepernick triggered a controversy after he posted a black and white close-up picture of his face with the words believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. This statement was in reference to a controversy that started in 2016. when Colin triggered a political row by kneeling during the US national anthem to protest against racial injustice and police brutality in America. Out of that protest by Colin Kaepernick, 49ers quarterback Despite backlash and calls for a boycott, Nike's bold marketing move paid off. The company gained support from people who shared their message, resulting in a surge in sales and breaking numerous records, including earning Emmy award for the most outstanding commercial of 2019. In fact, Nike's brand value increased by 6 billion dollars and their sales surged by 31%. While some people did boycott the company and even destroyed their products, it had little significance or no major impact on their sales. Although numerous factors impact sales, it's undeniable that Nike's advertising campaigns have significantly contributed to its success. Since the first Just Do It campaign launched in 1988, their sales skyrocketed from 800 million dollars to 9.2 billion dollars in 1998. After about 4 decades, Phil stepped down as CEO of Nike in November 2004. His journey from an inexperienced kid to establishing the world's largest sports brand has been remarkable. As Phil's story illustrates, timing is never perfect and sometimes you must take a leap of faith or in Nike's words, just do it. <laughs>